And the reason trees are important, I didn't know that in Irmo, if you have a nice tree in front of your house, and maybe you have an 85-year-old <clears throat> grandfather or somebody who'd like to sit in that tree and enjoy the shade, he can't do it in Irmo because Irmo has a regulation that there is no lawn chairs, no, no lawn furniture of any kind permitted in front yards. Do <laughs> what? I didn't know that. I, I didn't Taking know. those court. <laughs> so get you those sofas from man. Rhodes. I, I moved here from a, a suburb of Chicago, and I thought we were close to Red China. We had some foolish laws and some harsh laws, but you could put a, a chair in your front yard, so I guess we're, uh, Chicago is a little bit ahead of Irmo. <clears throat> but what Irmo is doing, or what they're proposing, is to say that if you rent a property in Irmo, you have to get a business license. And as soon as you get that business license, that gives the code enforcement officer and the chief of Irmo police authority to come on your property anytime, day or night, look, look for infractions which might be high grass. Uh, if your tenant put up his used refrigerator yesterday, you are responsible for removing that. And if you don't do it, you can be taken into court and potentially you could go to jail the same as the lady in Somerville. Uh, <clears throat> what the ordinance has been proposed is written in very, very general terms. And what they're looking for is to go out to other communities in South Carolina and get an idea of what, what those communities have put in place and they're going to copy that. So uh, it's moving. I don't know how fast it's going to go. But it has a lot of support from people in the community because it doesn't affect the homeowner. We, we carried petitions in the Coldstream area for the county ordinance and we got very good support from those people saying that they didn't want it. I, I, I just talked to some people in Irmo casually and they, they said, well, it's a good idea, you know, because rental properties, they're the people who are least desirable in the community and it only affects them, it doesn't affect me. And they don't stop to think the next step is to bring it to everyone. And what it does to the, the landlord, it gives the tenant a hammer over his head. If, it, if he's got any kind of a grievance against the landlord, he can throw trash out in his yard, call the Irmo enforcement officer and say, uh, the landlord's gotta do something about it. So, there, there's so many reasons that it, it's unfair, it's unconstitutional, and it, it makes no sense. But I do think it's a good idea to keep lawn furniture out of the front yard. <laughs> I've never seen laws where it's unlawful to have a basketball court where you can see it from the front of the house. Like if you have it on a side driveway and you can't put a basketball uh, goal up, are there? There's, there's been some discussion about that. If you and can't park so far, a pickup a truck where it can be seen from the front of your house. You see, but here's the thing. There are plenty of housing developments that have homeowner associations. So if you say, wake up one morning and say, I would like to live in a neighborhood where you can't have lawn chairs in the front yard, you can't park your car in the front yard, you can't have a tool shed in the yard, therefore, you, know, you can you can move into a homeowners association neighborhood that has those requirements. Yeah, I, I rent. You know, I I still own a house in Colorado. I have been able to sell, so I rent here, and I rent in a neighborhood that has an HOA, and I'm required to abide by the HOA. Yeah, I mean, that's, and, and you're, if, required, if, you're required. But it doesn't have yeah. the the potential to drag you into court and right. put you in jail. Right. No. What yeah. no. What I'm saying is no. I'm not, I'm not saying in favor of, of government laws. I'm saying. That, that if you have an HOA, the rental person renting the home has to abide by the HOA. So, yeah. so you don't need government regulations. If you want that protection against people renting out property, move to a neighborhood that has an HOA, and then the renters will have to follow the HOA. Definitely. Yeah, that's it, my point. As a renter, can, can your landlord come into your house at 10 o'clock this morning or come into your yard? Not in South Carolina. No. No, but, uh, uh, but, yeah, but Corey, Corey, the is it not enforcement officer in Irma would have the permission to come on your property no, 24 wait. hours a day? Not mine. Corey, is it not true that more fluent people rent or own homes where there are HOAs in neighborhoods? Your your poor people who rent from some other landlords may not live in areas where there are 
HOAs. And so do those people not need to have the same kind of or similar protections that you have as an HOA member? And so we look to government, let our city. That's not a government state, role. Wow. The nation take care of poor folks. Isn't that true? No, so they, 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 so <laughs> they take care of the that's poor folks. That's not the role of government. Right, but they take care of the poor folks right, by, by taking per, money by from them to use to fund using force against them. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what they say? Perfect. That makes, I, that, you know, I've never heard of a better idea in my life. I'm going to steal from people so that I can have the money to use force against them. Sir. That makes perfect sense. What they're all but well, yeah, they're, they're saying they're saying that these people can't get together. They're, they can't form an HOA. Why so we, as city council, are going to provide that service for them at the expense of everybody else. Well, they don't have to pay an HOA fee, so we're going to get it to you free. But that's and it's taking money from this taxpayer, the, the the landlord who owns the property and has to pay the taxes, and giving it to these people to for their you know protection. That, that isn't the argument they're using. The oh. argument they're using is to say, if you own a, a very nice piece of property and you've got somebody that lives close to you that has a rundown property, it affects your property value. No, it doesn't. Well, but well, you but that's their argument. Put up a uh, privacy fence, you know, and drive off. Uh, yeah, may I say something? Jim has a point. Yeah. 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 When, when you mentioned that it uh, was a bad yeah. idea, when you did, you, you're you talking because you don't like this new proposal. I, I don't think it's constitutional. Yeah, but you did it. it you you uh, stated that you were in favor of not allowing people to have uh, lawn chairs in the front yard. Isn't that so? I mean, I, I you said you were in favor of the, the fa not allowing uh, people to have lawn chairs in their front yard. No, I, I was being facetious. Okay. I, 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 I think I've got a right to put a lawn chair in my yeah. front yard. I was being facetious too. I know. I mean, I, I, I detected that uh, fairly early on. I didn't. I wasn't sure about the other one, but the uh, uh, it is, of course, a property rights issue, and that's what we uh, Sean, uh, who was the one who was the uh, the house member who was who sponsored the property police bill first of all, the, the Republican. Brad Matthews. Brad Matthews. No. Sean is his name. Anyway, we went to talk to him. And, Sean, uh, Sean Massey. Sean Massey, yeah. right. And, uh, and the group, all of us, were a number of us there at a town meeting he had, and we pointed out to him that dictum that um, first they came for these people, you know, the communists, and I wasn't a communist and so forth. And we made it clear that we believed it was a property rights issue. It was cut and dried on the face of it. He was saying that a lot of renters are from out of state. They neglect what their property here. The, the landlord is from out of state. That's right. And so, uh, therefore, we can single them out as uh, people likely to be irresponsible from our standpoint and, and having uh, only one value, getting some money and not having, being bothered. And, but also because they're a minority that is not protected. Actually, they don't even vote in the district. So uh, they can be um, um, thought of as, not, as easy prey. And, not, uh, and no one will take their part. But therefore, I think uh, we have to uh, get in front of public officials and point this out that we understand that this is principle. It's not necessarily what we want even. We don't care. We would like to have people clean up their yards. But we will not go this route on account of it being a property rights issue, and our our rights fundamentally come from property rights. If you if you chip those away, you have no defense against a government that'll do anything any day. I agree with you one hundred percent. One other thing too about property: if you have a car up on blocks, uh, uh, covered by canvas, okay. You must maintain license plates on that car because if a cop comes on your property, say you call for a safety inspection of your house when you're going away, and he looks under that canvas and sees no plates, he's going to give you a ticket. They will do it in case. They, Why, how does he get to come on your property and look under the canvas? They well, if you call the police and have them do a security check around your house when you're on vacation or why would you, why would you do that when you could why why would you do that for for insurance purposes you can go around and take pictures
they come while he's gone. They, they they did did no, he said he well, called. Um, yeah, you call Casey cops and they come in. They they <laughs> well, well, Al's comment just reminds me of the, the time that, that I got a knock on my door one time from the Casey police because I had a car parked in my driveway. I had actually put the wrong sticker on. I put it on for another car, and it was one month expired. And you can't park a car in Casey without a current uh, registration. <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, I had the registration. I said, see, that, that car is does have a current registration. I just put the wrong sticker on it. And, and they didn't ticket me, but it, it was surprising that they would come knock on my door about that. So there's but, some policy though. Did you, did, you <laughs> yeah, thank, did you thank them for not ticketing me? I absolutely did. <laughs> oh, I'm always playing to Thank you, old oh, great. Uh, uh. But, 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 but what I, I want to mention was. I carry a gun working out like to me. Corey, you always make the point that, that government causes a lot of problems that they come in and try to solve. Well, <laughs> the one of the. One of the major neighborhoods they're talking about that they need to have this law for is New Friars Gate. And when, when Friars Gate was originally built back in the 60s and 70s, they had deeds and covenants on those properties so that, so that the homeowners could control what was going on in the neighborhood as, as, they, uh, as the developer saw it was necessary. Well, in South Carolina, uh, I, I don't know the exact legal part of this, um, there's an, I don't know if you know anything regarding this, but uh, deeds and covenants are generally not enforceable after 20 years. So the government won't, won't allow those people to enforce things that should be enforced by private citizens. And instead is now saying it's a governmental problem that they have to enforce it on everybody. It was a governmental problem that they created by, yes. by, by refusing to allowing, to allow the private citizens to get together and agree to deeds and covenants that, that, that they deem necessary. So that's something that I wasn't aware You're saying that the people in Friar Street can't get together and see what they're going to do because the government says they can't. Um, well, no. When they, when they originally developed the subdivision, Mungo made deeds and covenants for, that prop, for those properties. You buy the property, you agree that you are not going to have a business on the property. Um, you know, the, kind of the standard things that usually see in zoning laws. Um, but now, since that, since those properties are all over 20 years old, they can't enforce the uh, the deeds and those deeds and covenants that they originally agreed to. But they could come up with new ones. Well, the government is is now taking over that role, apparently, or wants to take over that role. And, well, has taken over that role because you can't you can't have a business in a residential area in Armo, of course. Well, okay, and that, and that troubles me too because they're saying me. if I'm going to rent a house, I got to go get a business license. But you can't have a business and but I can't a resident. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. fundraiser. You have to get a business license yeah. in order to rent. So here, so here's a, here, well, that's here's what one, this law is proposing. One, 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 one last thing I think that people need to kind of understand. I mean, the private property right that shuts any argument down in, in my opinion because private property right is absolute, but when you have to deal with people, why is it that we assume that um, when I buy a home, I should be guaranteed that the value goes up, or that I should be protected against the value going down by government? Government should come in and stamp out any people who in the neighborhood who might cause my value to go down. It's an investment. You, you stand, you take a risk when you buy a home. I mean, you know, that's some people rent because they don't want to take. But as an American, I don't want to take a risk. So that's why I've got Obama. Right. That's what. That's my plan. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good place to end. That makes a place to be here. Let's get that man. Let's just say that you know we've got these complex topics, and appreciate the honorable David James who was on county council for two terms. He probably voted no more than any other councilman, and he's a real estate person, so he knows a lot about it. But this is a very complex. Topic. So remember, everyone who stands up here is responsible for their own comments. There's no implied or implicit endorsement by the group because of what a person says up here. So this is a forum for everyone to have to have their free speech and to, to speak their opinions in their mind. So that said, uh, before we go to any politicians, I know uh, we have one other person that needs to make a. Uh, uh, there's an upcoming event. Ross Snell wants to talk about the 19th Ross. Your opinions. Would you stand up and tell America what's what you're doing? Ross oh, America! Is up, reorganizing Pineview Precinct, right? Pineview Precinct. Well, not reorganizing. 
Uh, Pine Butte Precinct is the second largest precinct in the county. Um, the last election cycle we had, um, I think about 1,700 total people to vote there. Um, and, and the people in Pine View are longtime residents for the most part. The neighborhoods off of Lee Park Road are great places. Um, the people do turn out to vote. The voting percentage is great. Um, I think Republican wise, it's about three fourths of the people who come out and vote. But in the, in the effort to bring the people who are on the ballot to the voting people in that precinct, we're having a precinct meeting type thing where it's hopefully we can get a thousand people, hopefully a thousand people from the neighborhood into a meeting place, the Ruritan Club. Um, building off the Methodist Park Road and the candidates who are on the ballot there to come and just meet and greet and we're going to have some refreshments and just be bushes for a couple of hours. What time is the start of us? Um, 6 to 8. So if you know anybody who lives in the Pine View Precinct or anybody who's been on the ballot in the Pine View Precinct, make sure they get there. Please. And what is it? What day? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the 19th of April. Um, <coughs> starting, I guess, with the Honorable Joe Wilson. He's been invited. Um, Bill Black's been invited, um, and everybody on down through. Um, we don't have a council member this time who's running. So, um, but everybody in between are probably um, 14 or 15 people in the ballot. Um, in time. So they, they're probably invited to come speak. Um, four clerks, all corners, um, one sheriff. And, and so um, we hope to have a. a group of candidates there that, that the voters who don't normally get to see, these are the people who decide. I, you know, we go to places like this and, and, and hear candidates speak, but the voters, the, the people who pay the bills, the people who pay the money, go to work, come home, live in that, that, that house, and I, I'll bet you that two-thirds of the homes or more in that area are owner-occupied. Um, they, they just, they're good Americans. They're the ones who pay the bills, who defend this country, and, and those are the people we're trying to get politicians out in front of to say, you know, I have a question about um, the property tax. Why would West Columbia propose this? Or, or I've got a friend who lives in Casey. Why would they do this? And, 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 and you know, you may not know the answer, but at the same time, you can say, well, you know, I've got a friend in Casey too. And, and they tend to like what they did, or they don't like it, or, or in Irma, or, or wherever. But at any rate, um, that's what we're doing. So, America, if you know anybody that, that, that really wants to be informed in the Pine View Precinct, bring them over. It's the second largest, and we're trying to get my My ultimate goal in this is I'd like to see Pine View 90% Republican, and I'd like to see 99% people out of the vote. Getting out the vote is the key. That's what's going on. You know, we talk about um, things going on in this country. As long as we get out and vote and express our opinion, we will survive this. It's when we become complacent and just sit back and, and grumble um, about, um, I don't like Obamacare because it doesn't include cost of living. It doesn't pay my power bill or my, my house payment while I'm in the hospital. You know, that's what I know. And I think that they really need to do that. So when you grumble about Obamacare, they move hard enough. But, and, and, but if we get out and, and, and just, you know, if, if everybody's out and sees what's going on and votes, go to the polls and votes. We've got two more elections, at least two more, um, June and November. So we got to run out as far as getting people to vote. Okay, thank you, America. Okay, that's all the public service. Robert, y'all have anything to say? Okay. Now, ladies first. Oh, thank you. What, you know, I knew I was in a group of gentlemen when I came in this morning. I was escorted in by one. Uh, good morning. It's nice to be back with you. I came solo today. And thank you for escorting me in these meetings. I appreciate it. My name is Suzanne Moore. For those of you that may not know me, I am a candidate for clerk of court, and I'm so delighted to be able to come here this morning and briefly just remind you that we do have an election on June the 12th, and I'm offering myself a to be the next clerk of court because I believe that I can make a difference. All of you that come to this meeting want to make a difference. The people that make comments about property rights, 
about any type of freedoms from our government. We all want to make a, a difference in what we say and what we do. I believe because of my experience working at the clerk of court for almost five years and dealing with the citizens of Lexington, I know up close and personal what goes on at the courthouse. And I believe very strongly that by being a clerk of court that is present daily, and I mean every day, not 134 days out of 270 days, it's very important to have a clerk that's there that's willing to help. Now, our current clerk, really and truly, eight, seven years ago, started out doing, I think she really felt like she was making a difference. And I, I voted for her, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I was very, very uh, interested in learning what went on at court, and I used that knowledge when I was working for her to learn what was going on and what happened. Unfortunately, I saw too often how people were treated, and that's the reason she made me her executive assistant, because I could reach out to people and I have a people personality. And I look forward to going back into that role and helping the people of Lexington and making a difference at the courthouse. The people that work there need to have someone that they are honored to serve. And they need to have someone that will be a good public servant and will do a wonderful job. Now, I'm not here to persuade you one way or the other. I'm just telling you that I'm one of you. I want to make a difference in my community just like you do. And I think if we all remember that, that we're here to make a difference, then our community, and this county in particular, will be a better place than we live. Thank you for your consideration, America. Those of you that don't know Lexington, it's a wonderful place to live, and the courthouse is a wonderful place to work. Thank you very much. Susan, uh, Tommy Linter is saying that, uh, that Beth is not uh, putting enough documents online that are, that are public documents that you go to the, the clerk's office and see in person, but they're not online. Beth said, says that she's not authorized by the state to I do heard, that. I heard, that she, I heard her say that. Um, unfortunately, part of that is true, part of it's not. The process of putting, scanning them and getting them online is an incredible undertaking. We have gone back with the courthouse back until 98 to scan all the records to make them available so that they can be on the, uh, can be on the computers to pull up. Um, but to make them available to the public citizens, there are laws that are in place because Social yeah, Security. Yeah, Tommy's, Tommy's saying not not documents that aren't available to the public. Any, he's saying that anything that's available that you can go out and look at, you know, that is available to the public should be scanned. So um, well, I think they're they're in the process of making these available because through the scanning process. Now Beth keeps saying that the legislature has not voted either enough money or has not made it legal for us to make those uh, presentable or uh, uh, available to the public. Um, I'm not quite sure if you want to know the truth that Tommy knows exactly what is going on at the courthouse. Um, I That's think why his, I was asking you. I think, his, I think his heart is in the right place, but I think Ms. Kerrig is correct when she says that right now we're waiting, she doesn't have the legal right to make those documents available. She is right about that. Yeah, well, she, he's not talking about ones that aren't available to the public. He's only talking about ones that are available to the public that, that haven't, haven't been have Are there Are there documents like that? Well, there are documents um, that possibly could fall into that category if they have not been closed or sealed by a judge. But right now, until we have everything available to make certain that people's privacy, social security numbers, uh, addresses, information that the general public really has no business in knowing uh, until we can make sure that the public is protected from knowing that information. We have to make certain that people's privacy is uh, represented and protected. So Tommy is, Tommy's right and Beth is right in that. Um, that they're, they both have about this much uh, rightness as far as uh, documents are concerned. I appreciate you asking the question. I don't know that I've made, it, I've made a difference. But that's some, a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Corey. That's very kind of you to say so. Well. Got one, one more question. So I have a question just because I'm in the middle of a probate thing with my father in another state. So how much information is Lexington looking at putting up? Because my address, even though I'm not named in my father's will, my name, my address, and all of this information has become public information in this state. 
up there. So what are they? Are they going to protect people here from that? Well, I think that's I what I that. think that's what the legislature. <laughs> what we're going back to now. How much information can be made available? Yeah. That's what we're looking at um, to protect um, the privacy of individual citizens and to protect. I mean, there are freedom of information rights that we do have. I'm working on a case myself now, um, but. We need to talk to your legislatures, legislators about it. The clerk of court has absolutely nothing to do with what the legislature is doing. We are merely the person that is the keeper of the records that manages and does what the legislature tells us we can do in court administration in downtown Columbia. Yes? I don't know what the law is in South Carolina, but I know what the law in North Carolina is. <coughs> my mother and sister died and left a house to me and my nephew. My nephew was uh, made the executor of the will, so he could rent the house out until he found a buyer. Okay? When he found a buyer, the buyer's check went to his lawyer, and then the lawyer had to make sure all bills were paid that my sister and mother uh, had, and then she made distribution of the rest of the money to me and my nephew. That way, there could be no shenanigans between my nephew and me. The lawyer had to make the distribution. So I hope that's the law here at South Carolina. Let's see you, but. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, let's, uh, lobbies are, uh, are specific yeah. to the probate court. Yeah. Once again. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's end this because time for it. Okay. Thank you very much. I, let's let's boss, right boss did have one I, I, I just want to comment uh, real quick. Um, I've done some research on this thing of county records online, and, and it seems that it's, the pressure is coming from the county to the state. The state's not just all of a sudden saying you can do it. And nationwide, many counties are going to the states, and so states are enacting laws saying, here's what you can do. Um, and the problem comes in in the privacy thing, blocking out social security numbers, driver's licenses, addresses. But many states have overcome that, and, and some of the municipal, municipal city and county offices on the courts are doing that now, and it's a growing thing. So it, it's just a matter of time before we get it. Okay. There's a lot of information, you know, we addressed all these issues before, but because of the limitations of time, we'll get into this. Let's get this out of hand, folks. Thank you very much. And we we'll probably need to speed up a little bit on the other candidates. Uh, let's see. Tori. I'm kind of tired of hearing me talk. No, 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 you can vote for me. As well, if you're a Democrat, you could, because they can vote everywhere and competitively. We can campaign for you. Can you? Yes. Yes. Are you a Democrat? I'm an independent, sir. A Democrat. <laughs> you're American. Of course, we get it. Thanks, sir. Um, so, I, 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 actually, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself personally. Yeah, I think everybody already knows my philosophical beliefs, and I'm talking about a lot. I was born and raised in Florence, South Carolina. Um, I uh, graduated from South Lawrence High School. I went to Francis Marion for a couple of years and I actually majored in political science because I wanted to be a lawyer until I found out that you had to hand your soul over whenever you walked in the door. So I uh, decided to go into computer uh, industry and transfer to Clemson and uh, got a degree in computer information systems and um, moved to Colorado. Lived there for about seven years, worked for uh, Sun Microsystems and um, decided that my kids probably would be better off knowing their grandparents. So we decided to move back. Um, and my in-laws, my wife was born and raised in Florence too, but my um, in-laws um, had moved, since moved to the uh, Chapin area. So um, when we moved back, we moved there because my dad, my dad passed away a few years ago and, all, and my mother um, is uh, in Florence, but she's uh, a little bit uninvolved. So um, moved back to be closer to my in-laws. Um, I, uh, when I was really young, I lived um, in a little community called PD. Um, and in our, it's just in, interesting, uh, you know, in case you ever get a trivia question, I guess. Um, in the uh, yard where I grew up in was a, uh, we lived right on the river, Great Beauty River. And uh, in the yard was a uh, large hole uh, right next to the river. There was uh, probably about a uh, eight, ten foot wide berm set, uh, separating the river from this large hole. 
and we called it the Della Hole, but it was actually where the um, Confederate gunboat was built. And the land that we lived on was where the Confederate camp was for the people who were building the Confederate gunboat. And they, when they finished it, they dug the berm out and floated a boat out into the river and sunk it. Well, they had sunk it. But they pretty much, they pretty much just got it out into the river and it, before it got sunk. Um, and Vine and Florence Museum are the uh, uh, propellers that they haven't recovered, but they haven't been able to ever find the gun. So my dad had a, always had all these theories about where they were and things like that. But um, so we, you know, we lived out in the middle of nowhere. I spent a lot of time out uh, finding a lot of things that were kind of buried, you know, but I, stuff I really wish I still had, like Confederate belt buckles and frames and handguns and things like that. So, um, but that's kind of my general high-level background. I lived in Mullins for a little while. Um, uh, I went to my ninth, my ninth grade year of high school, I was a, a Mullins auctioneer until I moved back to Florence, um, which is an interesting, you know, uh, area in Marion County, so I, I'm familiar with a, a lot of that part of the state. Uh, my grandfather, um, my, my dad's father was an accountant and owned his own uh, accounting firm in Florence, and my mother's father was CEO of TransSouth. Um, it started out as Stevenson Finance, um, and uh, later on, when he retired, he sold out his uh, uh, major holding interest in Trans Um So that's basically where I come from. I, I'm quite a bit different than the guy I'm running against because I don't come from. Even though my grandfather was CEO of Trans South and all that, he he kind of made some really bad decisions, and uh, my step grandmother kind of uh, went off with what, whatever he had well he had acquired, um, and uh, so basically. Uh, I don't come from any real money or privilege. Um, I'm just an average, everyday kind of person who um, is pretty sick and tired of uh, the only principle that politicians seem to hold is to get reelected. Um, you, everybody in this room should know I have no problem telling people what I think, um, and I won't change that. I don't. I, I don't. I don't need extra friends. I don't care about being popular. I care about doing what's right. And if you want to hear me tell you what you want to hear, you're out of luck unless what you want to hear is the right thing or what I believe is the right thing. Um, and I have no problem doing that and being in office, getting in office ain't going to change that. As a matter of fact, it probably will make it a little bit worse. Um, because I think it is even more imperative uh, when you're, uh, if you were in office, to stand for principle. Um, that, that, in my opinion, is what causes everyone to go the wrong way. Is they get in office, and like David and I are talking about, you get in these meetings, and you, you're in this echo chamber of people who spend all their time with their hands out, um, wanting something from government. Um, I don't have a problem telling somebody to shut up. Um, you know whether it's lobbyists or the uh, South Carolina Association of Counties or whoever it may be. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe, um, I don't believe in this whole idea that um, certain people should be treated just with a basic concept of respect. And respect is earned. And if you are, disres if you are a disrespectable person, you don't get respect from it. And that doesn't mean I'm going to go overboard with it, but, but I, this whole idea that, oh, well, that is, that is the honorable social No, no, no. They put their pants on one leg at a time, just like the rest of them. Nobody, not really anybody's any better than anybody else. And, and that whole idea of certain people live on a pedestal, no. I, I got no time for it, I got no use for it, and it's counterproductive. It's what causes things to, to the wrong thing to get done, and things that need to get done to not get done. Uh, everybody seems to be too afraid of what may happen or what ha you know what people are going to think. I, I can't control what people think, so the best thing I can do is what I think is right. Um, and and you're going to think what you want to think anyway. So I, that's just the way I, I, I go in my political philosophy again if you want, but I think everybody kind of understands. Any questions? Or? I 
I, I appreciate knowing your background because I think that's great. I too am from Florence, so there must be something over in the PD that we bring to the Midlands that um, they need. No, um, I. Honestly, I think what it is is um, the PD is such a crap hole that. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, I got out as soon as I could. Well, I do, but but we have much more than I just wanted oh, to. Okay. Okay. Must be the water. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Corey here, folks. How are you going to explain that? When it goes on the internet. I'm not running for uh, I'm not running for Council. <laughs> we don't worry too much about political correctness anyway. Well, uh, if, if, some, if you're not clear on some of the candidates' positions, you know, don't hesitate to contact these people. All the contact information is public info for everyone who's filed for office in Lake County. So the good thing about politics here is that it's, it's entertaining and minimal. So we've got, but anyway, I want to thank everyone. We got one more candidate left, not the last one. Yeah. District uh, House Seat 39, Eddie McCain. Eddie, come on up. Eddie, and Eddie's got something around his neck he wants to explain to everyone. And show, show America. Make sure they got it on the on the video. Uh, who's uh, well, this is my business card that says "Freedom Nuts." We're nuts about freedom, and uh, the reason why that has become my slogan as I've mentioned before, is that it just seems like every time I turn around from the county level all the way to the federal level, we've always got somebody trying to pass legislation that's taking more and more of our freedoms away from us. Um, I think last week I spoke and uh, I mentioned that uh, you know, if we just simply allow people to, to earn an income out of their home, we would eliminate a lot of our economic problems. And I'm kind of a reflection to that a little bit. Uh, this coming July, my wife and I have been married 28 years. And uh, right. when I got married, my wife and I married, I was actually living in Lynchburg, Virginia. And like most young married couples in college, we were broke. I mean, we didn't have any money. And uh, I remember one day uh, telling my wife, I said, you know what, baby? I made more money than this. I was working a minimum wage job while I was going through college, and she was doing the same thing. I made more money than this when I was in high school pushing a lawnmower. But I, I didn't have enough money to buy a lawnmower. I didn't have enough money to start a business. But I got to thinking one day. I went to a, um, a repair shop, a guy that repairs lawnmowers and weed eaters. He had a lawn boy push mower he wanted $100 for, and he had a weed eater that he wanted $100 for. So I'm thinking, 200 bucks, I can be in business. But I didn't have 200 bucks. So I went out on a Friday, all day long. I didn't have class that day. I went out all day long knocking on doors, residential doors, business doors. And at the end of the day, I had 11 people who said I could cut their grass. That, um, that evening, I went to this store. I wrote a hot check, man. I ain't have a dime in my bank account. I wrote a $200 check to this guy for the lawnmower and the weed eater. <coughs> Saturday morning, I was a grass cutting fool. I cut grass from sun up to sundown. Monday morning, I had my money. I was at the, I was literally at the bank door before they opened. I was terrified of getting caught with a bad check. <laughs> and uh, they opened up, the, they unlocked the door, I walked in, I deposited that money into the bank account, and the Lone Ranger was in business. All right. And for the next three years, I pushed the lawnmower through college. Um, I hired people that I went to school with to help me. I started out doing a few houses and a few small places like Burger King and an appliance store. And uh, three years later, when I gave it up, I was doing apartment complexes. I, I was buying, instead of buying a hundred dollar long bore, long boy, long bore, I was now buying three thousand dollar pieces of equipment. I never asked for anybody's permission to go in business. I never bought a business license. The only thing, the only thing I, the only thing I did buy was liability insurance. You know, in case a rock flew up and hit somebody's, hit hit a person or, or hit somebody. Um, and I did okay. I make money, I'm able to take care of my family, my uh, um, 
I, I was able to help other guys I went to school with who helped me push more and more. Sometimes I had as many as five or six guys out there pushing mowers on his apartment complexes. Today, if I was in that same situation, I couldn't do it. I, I wouldn't be able to afford the, 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 the license and all the other requirements. One of the reasons why I got out of the business is because I was looking at a, a, a apartment complex they needed somebody to cut their grass, but it was, it was I guess, it was a government-owned complex. And one of the requirements was you had to hire people that worked inside that complex. And this is where all the thugs live. And um, I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to hire people that I, you're afraid they're going to steal my equipment. But the, bo the bottom line is, is that people have a right to eat. People have a right to have a, a roof over their head. And government does not have the right to tell you you can't start a business unless you pay them first, unless you get approval from them. You should be able to earn, a, earn your own income without having anything at all to do with the government, period. It's not the government's business for you to tell you you can't do something. When the government oppresses people like that, then people, it puts people into a, a negative thinking process to where they, they just don't know they can help themselves. Now, I'll give you one more illustration and I'll, I'll sit down because I know I'm probably over extending my time. But during the same period is when video stores started opening up. We know how you could go to the store and rent a video, VHS video. And there was a company in Lynchburg, Virginia called Adventureland, Michelin Video. It was a brand new concept back in 1984, 85. This is all this was taking place to actually go and rent a video. You know, and rent a, you rented the machines back then. Nobody owned VCRs. You had to rent the VCR and then you rent the, the video. Well, they had a camcorder. Now, I'm not talking about the camcorders you see today. But they, they had they were selling camcorders where you had the big the big side bag. It was like two thousand bucks, and that was a, that's a lot of money now. That's a whole lot of money to me back in 1984, and I wanted that camera so bad. I would go in there and I'd play with it, but I just didn't have the money for it. And uh, they would finance it with five hundred dollars down. So I got to thinking, how can I make that camera pay for itself? And I figured it out. I said, man, I know, I know nothing about video. Nothing. I don't know what panning is or nothing, but I knew I wanted that. And it was color, too. It wasn't black and white. It was color. I said, if I can get that, man, I can do birthday parties. I can do weddings. I can do all kinds of things and make it pay for itself. So I took my master car that had a $500 limit on it, and I put $500 on that machine, financed it. My payments were like $65 a month. I took that camera back to the trailer park I was living in, the 501 Trailer Court, right behind Honky Tonk Heaven, or whatever it was called. And I got that camera and I started playing around the neighborhood. And I put the word out, any birthday parties, I'll do it for free. Because I just want to learn how to use the camera. I had a guy across the street was having a party. I went over there and I learned how to pan, how to scan, and all this kind of got where I could do it pretty well. And I'd go to my friend's house, I'd be videotaping, and I got where I was pretty good. You know what I did? I went to, I didn't, I didn't call the government, I didn't go ask for a business license. I just went straight to the, uh, the printing shop and said, I want some cars printed up, I'm going to call myself Capture the Moment Video Services. Had some business cars printed up. I met a guy who was an artist, he drew me up some flyers. I passed them out. Next thing you know, I'm doing weddings, I'm doing kindergarten graduations. I'm doing video letters, people who had loved ones who were in the military before, long before I joined, and they were overseas. I put them on tape, and they mailed the VHS tape to their loved ones. But bottom line is I paid for my camera, and I put money in my pocket. I remember one day I came home, I made $180 that day. I was the happiest guy in the world. I started out that morning with no money in my pocket, come home with 180 bucks. I was like, man, this is what it's all about. Never saw after a business license. I just went and did it. And that's, that's how it needs to be today. People need to realize that they have capabilities. They have God-given talents with just a little bit of initiative, a little bit of creativity. There are things that you can do that you can bring money home 
You don't have to live in poverty. You don't have to have bills piling up because you can't pay them. You can earn your own money. There are books. You can go to the bookstore and get all kinds of ideas. Go to the business section and you'll find books. 280 businesses you can start from home. 400 businesses you can start for less than 200. There are all kinds of books that give you, they don't really give you all the details, but it gives you the big picture and it helps you think and become creative on how you can build small businesses for yourself. Yes, sir? Did you pay your FICA taxes? <laughs> I have you cut the camera off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I, just, no, I, did, I did pay taxes, yeah. Hey, when did it become law that you had to have a business license? It was probably, to be honest with you, it was probably law back then. I just didn't know me. Yeah, that was a law. I just, just, I just didn't know him. They didn't enforce it the way they do now. He does yeah. need well, a business license. How did you can. pay FICA taxes without a business license? How did you pay it on your employees? <laughs> <laughs> Get I, cash I, I money. I tell, you, I tell you exactly what I did, man. <laughs> I, I paid five bucks an hour. <laughs> cash. <laughs> yeah. Cash. You know, cash on the label. Eddie, you had with your information and the knowledge that you have, he may be out of a job in here. <laughs> you know how to pan and do all that. It's kind of, kind of hard to fire a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can cut your pay. <laughs> 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 now you have a business license for a sale of lemonade. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's nuts. And you had independent contractors. Yes. You, you just pay them. Let them worry about your own tax. Uh, right, that's what I did. I just, 1099. That's right. I just, you know. One more question. I have the other question. Yeah, 1099 got lost on the mail. Yeah, it never okay. made it to the mailbox. <laughs> okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and take it. There you go, man. Um, Mr. Burbage? Mr. Burbage always has the right questions. Mr. You got a final comment, Mr. Burbage? No, I what about the FICA tax? Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to mention Social Security. Let, I did already. Fight let's, uh, let, me, let me say this. We've got uh, a lot of issues that we're talking about today. We, saw, we also have a number of candidates uh, that are here and some are out looking at this, this video. But it's tough to run as a candidate. And, you know, so give support. Even though some of these ideas you may or may not agree with, it's very hard to run as a candidate, support, try to support these fundamental concepts of freedom this country is about. And this is what you've been hearing about. Different takes, some people disagree on things, but you know, this, the presentations each person makes, this, this his or her own presentations, and their opinions, but it's very hard. So support their ability and freedom to run for office. And as Ross Snell talked about earlier, keeping people involved is important. So uh, to, to have, a voice in your government. If we neglect that, we're going to end up without a voice. So, America, anytime you're coming through Casey, South Carolina, the metro area of Casey, Springdale, West Columbia, stop by the Shoney's here near the airport. Until next week, signing off, Steve Ice. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, we're going to have a yeah. green screen next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next